size some nymphs here. <laughs> the dreaded glad, glad to have the Canadian hecklers with me here. <laughs> well, I'm within throwing range, so you can hit me with scissors if you have. Okay, so this first fly I'm going to tie is called the Quildagon, and this is basically a quill bodied version of a Peridagon. And right now, during the middle of the Betis uh, hatches, this has been a very good pattern for me. Um, it's kind of a go-to betas nymph and or just any other small mayfly. So I have some 16-aught Vivas thread here, and I of course have uh, the right color that I wanted buried in the bag, but um, it doesn't really matter because it pretty much gets covered up here. So I'm just going to make uh, a thin thread base here, and then I have some Coque de Leon. And you could use whatever shade you want. This is a dark pardo. And I only want to get three or four strands of this any more than that. And the tail is going to be a little bit too overdressed because remember that all mayflies either have two or three tails. And if we start having six or seven, like you might see in a lot of commercial flies, it looks a little hokey. Plus, it'll slow your sink rate down. So I've got four fibers here. And I'm going to use a pinch wrap. So I'm going to go into my fingers here that I'm holding, around the hook shank before I put any tension, and then lift up, and then apply tension. And what that does is it locks those tails straight on. And I made them a little long, so I'm just gonna pull them tight there. Now, um, if you end up having problems with tails fouling around your hook sometimes during the drift, this is an easy way to fix it. Just take your thread, put it right under it, with a little tension, then it'll cock those tail fibers up and away from the hook so they're not fouling around. Okay, so I've tied to the front. I'm gonna run to the back again. And this is just a little element of attraction here. So I just have some micro flashaboo. And I'm gonna put a little tag at the back of this. And I like to pull that fiber back so that I don't really have to trim any of it off. So just make your first wrap or second wrap, slide it back until it's almost hidden. And I'm going to take three wraps forward with the thread and make two to three wraps of this tinsel at the back. And that just forms a nice little piece of attraction there, a trigger point at the back of the hook. Okay, so then I have a, uh, pe a strip peacock quill, and lots of people strip their own, but I find that to be um, worth uh, freaking out over because it just takes way too much time and effort. And I either bleach them and screw them up through the bleaching process, or I sit there with a half, for half an hour with an, an eraser and want to pull my hair out by the time it's done. So I let the fine people at Polish Quills do it for me instead. And they have a whole bunch of different colors, which are great. Now, um, the proper way to, to use this when you're tying a whole bunch of these, take however many you're going to tie and put them in a little bowl of water so they can soak. I, I pulled this out a few minutes ago and stuck it in my mouth for a second to try and soften it up, but I don't know how soft it's gotten. So you want to get it soft so that it's malleable. Um, otherwise, these can be kind of brittle at first. And then the other important thing is you want to find the dark edge and the light edge. And if you're tying it in so that uh, the, it's on the side of the hook where you're at, then the dark edge needs to be down. If you're tying it in on the other side, which is normally what I do, so that the first wrap goes under the body, then the dark edge needs to be up because it needs to be in back as you make your wraps forward. So I'm just going to pinch wrap at the front there. it backwards, so let's flip it around. There we go. Okay. It's also not all that bright of a light, so I couldn't see very well. Yeah. We see it great. Yeah. I don't, but uh, then what you want to do is just lay your thread base down. So you're not really having, that, that quill is very thin, and it's not going to make its own taper. So if you want to build a little bit of a taper under this body, you got to do it with the thread. And then I'm going to use the rotary function to be able to do this. So I put the thread right up front, th 
throw a quick two turn whip finish in there and then just use the vise to wrap this forward and you want carefully spaced turns so that you see that rib from that peacock quilt each time. What you don't want is really tight turns so that they're almost overlapping and you also don't want really spread out turns because then you're only going to get a few wraps and there's going to be thread showing underneath. Okay, so then I'm just going to throw a couple of whip finishes in here mainly just to help build a little bump to look more like a thorax up front. And then we're going to put a wing case in with, oh look, I think my nail polish got left at home. <laughs> it was right here this morning. Yep, I don't think it made it. So normally I'll throw some nail polish on the top here and let it dry. Uh, black nail polish. But instead what we can do to put a little dark wing pad here, I've got some black thread instead. And I'm just going to make a little black thread bump here. And if you look at most Betas nymphs, right when they're about to hatch, they get pretty dark wing pads. And they can be significantly darker than the rest of the insect uh, when you look at them in your hand. And so even though it may not make that much difference, um, a lot of times I'll add that little wing pad to give a bit of contrast and maybe look like the natural insect. Uh, and if you look at most paradigms that are out there, uh, this is the Spanish style fly and it's tied specifically to be able to sink. Um, really the only appendage that's slowing anything down is the tails. The rest of the body is all smooth and hard and I'm going to cover it in resin so it'll sink like a rock and peritagone in Spanish actually translates to pellet. So a lot of the Spaniards when they're talking to us about them, they'll talk about them as pellets. Um, but uh, they'll put little dark wing pads on them with nail polish or with uh, sharpies, things like that. All right. So. The only way, uh, the easy way to finish this fly now is just cover it in some resin. And this is Solares Bone Dry. And I like this because for a few reasons. Number one, it's really thin, so I don't get a big glob here. And it's easy to apply without adding too much to the body. And then if I get a little bit of a, of a too much in one spot, I can just kind of dab it and it'll smooth the body out there. And then this resin also stays clear and bright and shiny in your box. A lot of the other resins I've tried, they'll sit in your box for a while, and especially if they're exposed to moisture, they'll get kind of cloudy and you can have kind of this milky looking fly after a while that you can't see the underbody and there's no point to it at, at that point. So the Bone Dry Solar Res is a really good product for that. So that's the finished Quildagone and it's a really simple fly. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll stage tie all of these, so especially if I'm doing the nail polish step, I'll tie a dozen of them to that point, let them sit on a block of foam, and by the time I get to the last one, the first couple have dried, and I can go back through and resin them all. And, you know, total time on this fly, once you get really quick at doing it, it's a couple minute fly, and I can go and put it on the bottom and, and some trees and lose a few, and I don't cry. So, so that's one of the best parts about peritagones and, and simple competition flies in general is they don't take a lot of time to tie and because of that you'll fish them where you won't fish other flies and you'll catch more fish because of it. Okay, so um, I was going to start with two peritagones because I was going to let the nail polish dry and then come back to them later, but I'll just keep going with my two peritagones with that plan anyway. So this is another peritagone. This is a, one that Umqua picked up from me. Uh, that will be available in next year's catalog and it's called the light bright peritagone and there's a whole bunch of different colors that they picked up this is one of my favorites that I've had fishing really well for me here this spring um, and uh, while it has an imitative mayfly shape it's more of an attractor based type uh, I guess hybrid so same, same start, I have three Coke de Leon fibers. I'm gonna pinch wrap it, get it in place, and wrap up to the front. And one of the things you may notice about this bead here 
It's not a standard tungsten bead, so I sell these in my shop at Tactical Fly Fisher. This is an inverting tungsten bead, and you'll notice that it's offset, so it's kind of a teardrop shape where all the weight is on top of the bead, and that's going to flip your fly upside down and invert it. And that way when you're drifting, a lot of times uh, when you're eonymphing, you're going to be ticking bottom every once in a while with your flies. You should be if you're, if you're down in the zone where the fish are at. And uh, if the fly is riding hook point down, you're more likely to either come in contact with rocks or to grab moss, sticks, etc. So if you can flip the fly upside down and have this, it's almost like a, a crankbait bill. And in, in, you know, if you think about that from a bass perspective, this shape of bead, for whatever reason, bounces over rocks more than just a regular slotted bead for me in a jig hook. So I feel like I don't wedge as much in between the cracks as I, I do with uh, regular beads. All right. Yeah. Uh, just super glue. That's all I really do. Um, Loctite brushable is my super glue of choice there. I'll do one for you in a second here just to show you. I probably won't. I've got other. I, I went and super glued them all on last night, so I wouldn't have to do that for these, but I'll show you how to do it. That's the whole reason I came. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do it, and it'll take about 10 seconds. So that's another thing that I'll stage tie. I'll just get all my beads on hooks, get them all sitting, ready to go, super glue them all, and put them in the foam, and then I can just pick them off. And sometimes if I've got a day where I don't have a lot of time to tie, but I want to prep for the next day when I do, I'll sit down and put a bunch of beads on hooks so that they're all ready to go when I sit down at the vise the next time. Okay, so I have root beer crystal flash here. and. I don't know why on earth they call this root beer because it's more amber than anything. I've never seen a root beer that's that color anyway. Must be a pale ale root beer or something. <laughs> but uh, um, it's a really interesting color. It, I don't I don't know why it works because there aren't a lot of uh, things anywhere close to this that I've found in nature. But um, it's been really successful for me, even during the middle of kind of some techie midge and beta hatches on the Provo this spring and winter. So I just tied the crystal flash into the back, right at the base of that those fibers or the tail fibers, and I am uh, I laid a base of thread down. Same thing. I want it thin. So one of the things you'll hear from European competitors that they'll say all the time is thin to win, thin to win, and. Um, not only are most things in nature quite a bit slimmer than me, we fly tires tend to make them when we put them on a hook, but the thinner you make your fly, the faster it's going to sink without additional weight. So if I can make my fly sink without additional weight, it's also going to drift better because it has less inertia once it gets down there. And then I'm just using that rotary function to lay a touching wraps of that crystal flash to the front. Now with, this, with these beads, it's kind of hard to get your scissors in on the top, so whenever you're tying materials down with this, it's wise to put it on the side or on the bottom where you can have better access with your scissors. Otherwise, you're going to have some tag ends that you can't get flush. So um, you can do that. In fact, I probably should have done this next step beforehand so I didn't leave tag ends, but I'm going to switch to a hot spot color for, uh, the, to finish the fly in the collar. So this is just fluorescent orange 16 knot Vivas. And normally I do this before I wrap the crystal flash body because then any of the tag ends from the thread that I have, I can bury under the crystal flash so they don't they aren't exposed and I don't cover them in resin and make them look funny. See, I've got a little tag end right there that I can't really get much closer with my thread or my scissors and that's going to be exposed in the resin. So it's wise to make that thread change before you wrap the crystal flash. But that's all right. It's cosmetic. It's not anything that's going to affect how the fly fishes. So I'm just putting a couple wet finishes in there to make that little hot spot. And this is the part where I would normally put that nail polish on. But instead I'll just cover it with the solar res. And you want to be careful also when you're applying this resin. When you come back here, on the bottom you can go all the way to the back. But on the top it's wise not to get all the way to the base at least the last tiny little bit, because if you get any of the resin in, uh, 
at the base of the tail, once you set it, it can be kind of brittle and fish it for a while and that tail is going to uh, break off basically in some fish's mouth. Okay, so that is the finished light bright pair to go in. And I had a little thread wrap that got mixed up in the resin there, but luckily, again, it's just cosmetic. All right, so we're gonna move on. Peridigones are uh, a really big staple of my 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 fishing right now um, for a reason. The Spaniards who came up with them, they've been uh, world champions and medalists uh, three times out of the last three years. And guess what they fish most of the time? They fish a lot of peridigones, and they work really well. Um, but we're gonna switch gears and go almost totally opposite. This is a, a big favorite of mine. Uh, I fish this fly. I, you know, if, if someone came to me and said, you know, what's your, what's like three flies you couldn't live without if you're going around? I get that question all the time and as a fly tire it drives you nuts, right? Because you can't do that. But, but there's no point in that. <laughs> Part of the fun is the variety. But if I had to go to a new river somewhere on the planet, and I had three flies that were going to come out of my box first. This is one of those three flies that would come out of my box first. It looks like absolutely nothing in nature, but it's one of those attractor patterns that, for whatever reason, the fish just love. And uh, we think of, you know, the Provo and most of the other tail waters around here as techie places where you've got to fish tiny little imitative flies that that's the only way to catch the fish. And I catch a lot of fish on this fly with on the Provo. So, all right. So I've got another uh, inverting bee here. In fact, before I forget, let's do one of those just so you can see what we do. So I can placate Mr. Rowley here in the front row. So this is the size 14 hook, and I've got a three millimeter version of this. And if you haven't used them before, some little bead tweezers like this will make your life a lot easier if you tie a lot of bead head style flies. Um, they have a little recess in the, in the tweezer. The other, other models I've seen have rubber tips on them to hold the bead as well. But this will keep you from launching beads across the room with hemostats or something, or sitting there trying to put little two millimeter beads on your hooks all the time with your fingertips, which unless you're my four year old who has uh, incredibly tiny fingers and a lot of dexterity, it's a little bit harder for the rest of us to do. So you can see that that bead just kind of stays down if it's left to its own devices here. So yeah, you could put some lead wire in there and I've done that in the past, but these days I'm trying to just tie my flies as thin as possible and that means eliminating lead wire most of the time. So the easiest thing to do is just slide the bead back, put a dab of super glue on the front. You don't want to get too much or too close to the front or else you'll get it in the hook eye. Then flip your vise upside down and slide that forward. And that should pretty much line it up on axis. Uh, what you don't want is it cocked off to the side from the hook point. You want the hook point and the bead facing opposite or else it'll spin in the water. Um, but as long as you do it where the hook point and the hook shank are vertical in line in the same plane, uh, then your bead will be in this right spot. And you can always check it by looking down on it. And there, it's set. I'm just gonna put it on some foam and you'll let that cure while you're tying the rest of your flies or just do them all at once. Now I gotta remember which one I just put on the phone. <laughs> There's an easy solution to that. I'll take the gold bead one and do that on the blowtorch because I know that that one's been on there. How's that the Hennig 430? This is a Dohiku 302. <laughs> okay. So, it doesn't really matter which thread you use on the back of this fly because it's not gonna show. We're gonna switch to a, Actually, you know what? We'll just do this red thread the whole way through. Because there's really no need to, to switch. So, start with some. This is 8 uni. You could use 16 out Beavis, whatever you got that's red. And I'm going to lay a quick thread base, come back most of the way up. Then I have some Globe Right number 5. And 
Uh, Globrite, if you haven't, if you've ever used fluorescent flosses, this is about the best fluorescent flo floss I've used. Um, it stays true to its name. It glows really well, and. Uh, it's a really famous material in the UK. They use it for all sorts of stuff on their flies over there. and um, I've come to love it for any sort of uh, hotspot tag or uh, wherever you need a big floss or even a wide thread, like when you're tying squirmies and you don't want to bind the material down and cut it. Globrite works really well for that. So I've, I've taken and cut it into three strips. I didn't do a very good job of getting, getting them equal, but it doesn't matter because you're going to trim it from the other side. And normally I'll just get however much of this stuff I think I need for a dozen flies or six or however many I'm tying, and I'll cut it into three, you know, close to equal strands, put them together, put just a couple wraps up there that are loose, and slide it back, and then you can bury it under your thread so you don't have to uh, trim it. And I don't like to come around to where the hook is going to bend. I want to stop before the hook starts the hook bend. And then I'll actually take and use that as a measuring device so I don't make my tag too long. So I'll just slide the scissors in on the back of the hook and trim it. And now I have that nice, clean, short tag. Most of the tag nibs that I see tied either have too long a tags or they have too much fiber. So people will stick like four, five, six, seven, you know, strands of floss in there and then they'll make the tag twice as long. And so instead of a trigger point, it becomes overwhelming on the fly. Like you can't see anything but the tag. And I don't think it, they fish as well. All right, so I'm coming back up to the front. And I'm gonna get some brassy diameter wire. Now this is another pattern that Umqua picked up from me. So it'll be in the catalog next year. Uh, on the commercial version, I put a little flashback in at this point, but most of the time when I'm lazy and I really want to bang these out, I just leave that off because it's already a flashy enough fly. So you want a pretty thick wire here because this fly is going to get chewed on and I want it to hold the dubbing down and not get broken by a fish, so that's why I'm using brassy size wire. It's going to bury into the dubbing so it's not all that visible anyway. And then you can use any number of dubbings for this. I usually like some shade of peacock. So a peacock black uh, ice dub is really well. I also have, <laughs> I grabbed this off the floor in my shop this morning because I just got a sea by order in and it was uh, on the floor so I put it in my pocket and I was like, I'm gonna tie a blowtorch with this today. So this is dark peacock, sea by fine flash. Fine flash is their version of ice dubbing and the cool part about the sea by versions, they have about 10 shades of peacock instead of like two and so there's some really unique shades that I can't get in any other dubbing um, that I like a lot specifically for blow torches but for other flies as well and like any Angelina fiber you know ice du based dubbing like this um, it's pretty coarse and it dubs kind of clumpy so just make sure you don't put on too much at a time or else you're gonna have a lumpy blow torch Okay, so we'll start with that, and if we can always add a little bit more if we need it, but I don't want to put too much on there and then have to take it off, because that's a lot harder. So I do need a little bit more. You want to leave just a tiny gap in front of that dubbing, because I'm going to tie in some hackle and a collar of dubbing. So maybe about there. In fact, we'll leave it there and I'm going to actually put a little dubbing bump after I put in the wire. So wrap your wire forward and tie it off. And now what I want, I'm going to put some CDC hackle in here. But if I just put the CDC hackle on it and then the body is slim like this, the CDC hackle will kind of flush back along the sides. And you get more movement out of it if you can prop the fibers out a little bit perpendicular to the body, or at least closer to perpendicular. So I'm going to put a little dubbing bump that it can you can kind of tie it up flush against. And 
Okay. Now you don't want to do that before the wire because if you put the wire in over the top, it's just going to anchor it down. So if you put that bump in afterwards, it gives it a little bit more bulbous um, piece of dubbing to, to fold around. Okay. So now I just have some natural CDC. And the great part about this CDC, I'll show you at the end what we can do here to use it for any size fly. So you look at this feather and you think, oh my gosh, those, those are some pretty long fibers, but we're, you can actually trim CDC with your fingernails so that you can make it work for any size fly that you've got. But most CDC feathers, especially good like premium CDC, this is some Petitjean CDC, and I've got feathers going everywhere now. Um, it's uh, usually fully fibered, which is great for a dry fly when you want enough CDC out there to spread out some weight and, and float your fly well. But if I tie this feather in as is, it's gonna make a really overdressed um, hackle here. So I do a couple of things when I prepare this feather. I trim off the bottom and the webby stuff on both sides, and then I pick one side, and actually this side looks better, so I'm gonna flip it around. And I trim up the side so that I only have one, one side left. And now when I make two or three turns, I get about the route, right amount of hackle. If I left it on, oh, what happens with CDC a lot too, because it's uh, so um, mobile and then not very stiff, you'll make a turn to tie it in and then all the fibers will clump together on one side of the fly and you'll get, like at your tie-in point, <laughs> you'll get 30 fibers of CDC sitting there and then the rest of it is all thin. So by trimming it off of one side of the fly, it ends up dressing it a lot better. So then I'm gonna stroke the fibers back, just like that, and have a tip to tie in. And when you tie that tip in, make sure you tie it down, but then also fold the tip back and put another wrap or two in front, and that'll help lock that in. If you don't do that, that quill can slide out and uh, drive you nuts, because usually it'll happen after you've already trimmed it, and you go to make your wrap, and then you have no tip to tie in with again. So you either gotta grab a new feather or your, your quill's gonna be shorter. And then I'm gonna use the rotary function again for a hackle, so put your whip finish in and put your bobbin on the cradle. And then just some basic hackle pliers here work just fine. Go ahead and get it started and right about two turns to maybe three depending upon the feather. And there again, you look at those fibers and they look really long, and they are, but we're gonna fix them in just a second. But first, before we do that, we are going to put a little collar in. So, um, if you're familiar with uh, Lance Egan's red dart, um, this has really similar color schemes. When we fish together, if he fishes a red dart, I fish a blowtorch, and if I fish a blowtorch, he fishes a red dart. So um, I just like the, the tag on it a little more than the red hackle, and then I have CDC instead of chicken hackle or hen hackle. Um, but this little UV pink ice dub hotspot up front is a common theme on both of them. So you want just a little bit enough to make a collar, but not so much that it's overwhelming. You also don't want to put it such a big collar that it pushes that hackle back against the body again. So uh, if you put too much dubbing on there, then it overwhelms that dubbing bump you put behind the CDC and will push it back. All right, so then whenever I finish flies that aren't covered in resin, I will take some super glue and put it on the thread. Just like that, well, that's a little too much. And if you put too much and there's a bunch of drops, you can always just take the shaft of the brush and touch it and it'll take it right back off. Then I'm gonna stroke the CDC back just so I make sure I don't get any super glue on it. I make three or four wraps with that super glue and then I come in and whip finish it. And you only need about three turns. And what that allows me to do, that glue being below the whip finish to begin with. The whip finish gets put over the top of the glue and then it all binds together. So that super glue in there, this fly, uh, it's really rare that I have a fly with the thread come off. 
it's got to get really beat up. I'll almost always lose the fly before the thread comes undone doing it that way. But also, by putting the super glue on before I do the whip finish, um, and I only have to make that one three-turn whip finish, so I don't have these big bulbous heads where if you, most people put in two, sometimes three whip, whip finishes to kind of um, compensate, but then you get overwhelming thread and it kind of covers the back of it. So this is a cleaner way where I can do just a few wraps at the head and have that super glue to hold it all together. Now, I'm going to take the bead or the, the fly, pull it out of the vise, and I'm basically going to separate that hackle into two halves. So stroke it from the top and the bottom, and then take my thumb and my index finger here and go right to the back of that hook and just break it off flush. Then come to the top, do the same thing again. And now, I have a CDC hackle that's actually some of those broke off a little bit short, but it's now at least the, the correct length for that, that hook. And the cool part is this is a size 14, but you can do this all the way down to you know size 18 and still have CDC hackle that will look the correct size. But breaking it off with your thumb and your index finger that way ends up looking better than if you just took scissors and trimmed it because then it looks flush and kind of unnatural. All right, so that's the blowtorch, and that is a go-getter. So tie some. Thin, thin it down? No. No, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be kind of an attractor, so uh, it doesn't need to be rail thin. Uh, I don't tie it any fatter than that, really. But, but yeah, it, it's, um, it doesn't have to be, you know, micro thin. Okay, so let me check my time here so I know what I've got. I don't even know where my, I think my phone's in the 10 to 10. Okay, so I got time for probably one more fly, uh, maybe two at the most. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's jump to a stone fly here. I was gonna do a soft tackle carrot, but you can look that up on my YouTube channel. So this fly is called the straggle stone. And this is another uh, pattern that Uncle picked up. It's in their catalog this year. And especially when the water is just a little bit off color and you want a stonefly pattern, this is a really good one for me because it's got a little bit of flash in it. So I'm going to start um, with some rubber legs here. And I'm just going to use some span flex. I like Spanflex or just the spandex type rubber leg material more than standard rubber because it can sit in your box for a while and it doesn't dry rot. So I can have these in my box for a couple years and it still works, whereas if you have more standard rubber, all of a sudden you have a fly that has no legs anymore when you pull it out of the box sometimes and you have little fibers sitting in the bottom of your box. So I took, the, I took the, the rubber leg and I trimmed it into a bunch of pieces like this, maybe, I don't know, inch and a half, two inches long. I used to hate tying with rubber legs and then I realized why am I leaving the leg intact? The hard part about tying with a rubber leg is that it's moving it around while you're you know, trying to wrap the thread, but if you just trim it, I don't care if I waste a quarter inch of rubber leg, right? It's not the end of the world. Uh, and so by not having a whole big part of waste there, there that you have to work around, um, rubber legs are a lot easier now. So uh, get it short, use a pinch wrap, and I usually tie on the far side of the fly first. These are gonna be the tails. So pinch it on the far side, put two wraps, pull that around, put that on the near side, and put a wrap or two over the top. And it's a little bit off kilter, so I'm gonna fix it with an additional wrap there, and now I have my tails in, all right? I'm gonna wrap forward and get some brassy sized copper wire. If it wants to come off the spool here for me, there we go. And go ahead and tie that in, and then the next step, we're going to add our wing, our shell back and wing case. And you can use fino skin for it, skinny skin, thin skin, any of the skins. 
and uh, you want to trim it maybe an eighth of an inch thick in between an eighth and a quarter probably thicker for larger flies than with this material you got a paper back you got to cut so when I cut it I always cut it with a bevel on both sides and now that makes it easier to remove that paper backing and also gives me an angled tie-in point. And then most of these types of materials have a matte side and a glossy side a lot of times. So find the glossy side and tie it in with that facing down. And that way when you fold it back over, the glossy side will actually be up. Now, what I'm doing here, I want to wrap that thread back to where it's flush with the legs, but unless you lift it up and look, sometimes it's hard to see whether you've gotten all the way back. So I make sure I wrap it all the way back. Then I'm taking some Semperfly straggle string here, and I can't remember which color this is, and for some reason they don't have them labeled on this card, but it, it's somewhere around a mustard or a lichen. I can't remember which one they label it. And uh, then I'm going to tie this in. Another material you could use is some micro UV polar chenille. But uh, micro UV polar chenille is better for larger sized versions of this fly. It's a little bit thicker braid and a little more bulbous material, so it'll make a, uh, a, more, a, he a more heavily dressed body. And one thing you can do on this fly, which I didn't do, is put in a lead underbody especially if you want to get it a little bit fat. This is going to end up being really skinny without any lead underneath. Um, so you can do that or you can uh, use a much fatter thread and just build up a thread body underneath if you don't need the extra weight. But today it's going to be a skinny stone. It's going to be the, the Gumby stone here. All right. So then I'm going to use the rotary function again and wrap this body. The other thing you can do is just kind of go back and forth to build up some extra. If you make a pass forward or a pass back and then a pass forward, now you have a nice abdomen there. And I'm going to pull that shell back over. Crank it down, pull my wire through, and with this material, if you aren't careful, you can trap a lot of the fibers with the wire, so I'm going to waggle it through so I make sure that I don't trap any more than necessary. It's just kind of like using wire to tie down hackle on a, a woolly bugger. you got to waggle it through so you don't trap all those fibers. All right, so then I pull that skinny skin back again, fold it back, and then it's going to be my wing case as well. And I have these two pre-trimmed legs sitting over here. And a lot of times these legs tend to have a little bit of curvature. They're not real straight. So just make sure that if they're like that, the curve faces out away from the fly. Otherwise the legs are going to fold in towards the body instead of out away from it. And if you don't get the legs placed perfectly from the beginning, that's okay. You can always use some materials to make them angle any way you want afterward. And on this one, uh, on the near side, I just use my thumb to trap it against the, the body of the fly to hold it there while I wrap. On this side, I'm going to use my index finger to do the same thing, do a pinch wrap while I'm at it and then make sure I line it up. So that one went underneath. So line it up right on the lateral side of the fly. Okay. Now, when I do this um, in a steelhead version, uh, what, which I call the magneto stone, 
uh, or you can do it in dirty water too and it really shows up well. I'll do a black abdomen and a purple thorax or the reverse. I'll do an a, a purple abdomen and a black thorax and then a pink bead. But with this, since we're actually sort of quasi imitating a golden stone here, I'm just gonna leave it the same, the same material for the thorax. And if you'll do um, a darker shell back with a lighter straggle string, you'll get a two-toned effect. And if you go out and stay in the river and find some uh, golden stones right now, most of them that you'll find are much darker on their dorsal side than their ventral side. So then just wrap it until you have a little bit bigger thorax than you had your abdomen. And what I could have done there too, it looks like my rear legs are sitting a little more flush towards the body. If that happens, you can put a wrap of that straggle string behind them first to prop them out. It'll be okay. But uh, they could have been a little bit more perpendicular to the fly if I'd done that. And pull that over for your wing case. And with these inverted beads, you kind of have to come in at an angle instead of straight down to get it to sit against the back of it. Make sure you don't trap that. And then the hardest part about this fly at the end is getting it clean with all those fibers not um, showing from the straggle string because they tend to get trapped under that last couple of thread wraps. So you either have to stroke them really well like that, and sometimes there'll still be some stragglers. I've got one on the near side that's just really stubborn, so you can use a, a fingernail to get it back and trap it. Okay, and then the other thing you can do if you, if you wanted to clean this up just a little bit, you could put a couple of wraps of dubbing there, just as a collar, and that'd hide all that. But most of the time, I don't care because the fish don't see it, or if they do, they don't care either. In the fly time, Peter, right now we have Nate Brumley, Boy Scott, and Advanced Dry Fly Fishing. That's the end. Dry Fly Innovation, stop by, he's got a lot of good things to say. So there's your straggle stone. All you got to do now is just trim their legs, and you're good to go. So I hope you guys enjoyed the Euro Nymphs today, and uh, most of these are, I have YouTube videos on, so you can always go and get them later. But feel free to send me an email and ask questions if you have them. Enjoy the rest of the expo, guys. I like that. I like that. <laughs>